The Zamfara state governor, Belu Matawali, has said that some repentant terrorists helped the state government to secure the release of the 279 schoolgirls of the government's secondary school in Jangebe. The governor also said they were released without paying any ransom. And reacting to the kidnapping, the Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika, attributed rising insecurity in the country to the activities of criminals who, he said, desire to humiliate the federal government. He claimed that the recently reorganized national security architecture will enhance or end the menace in the country. Well, joining us to discuss this is Dr. Obadiah Meilafia. He's a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So let's, I mean, you and I have had a conversation before about the um, insecurity that's been spreading like wildfire, not just in the northeast, but now in the north, um, west and of course it's spreading all the way down to the south. Um, how does Sirica, the minister, is saying that these bandits are out to embarrass the federal government um, with the abductions? And I'm wondering, is that the kind of a, a reaction that we expect in the midst of the kind of crisis that we're experiencing in the country with girls and boys being kidnapped back to back, same form, same manner, and of course all we do is wait to negotiate and bring them back? Well, for a government to talk in terms of somebody trying or some group of people trying to embarrass them, uh, I think looks uh, totally irrelevant to what is happening. They are out on a mission. They are out to kidnap, to profiteer, to kill, to rape. And they're doing that on a daily basis. Uh, and we're lucky if it is just an embarrassment. What that has done really is to eat into the moral fabric of our society. So our country and our nation is now decaying from the inside. You see, what these things do to a state is to continually um, undermine its moral foundations. So if, if people can get away with uh, kidnapping, with raping and profiteering from them, what stops them you know, carrying guns and starting a war if that looks even more pro profitable in the future? And very sadly, the anarchy we're experiencing is now going uh, in, in, in that direction. Uh, it is very serious. And I don't think we are approaching it with the seriousness and with the sense of uh, responsibility that this requires. Well, the federal government has been giving well, a lot of assurances. They've been saying that these abductions, this banditry and terrorism uh, is going to end soon. They've been saying that um, with the new security architecture that's in place, this is all going to be a thing of the past. Can we really take the federal government for their word? Because we've heard this you know, line of statement over and over again. Why should we take this particular one um, any serious? No, I wouldn't take them at all any seriously. A young man was caught recently, a Fulani youth was caught, and he said that, look, we, we deal in cows. You know, how much does an AK-47 cost? We have been given these arms and, you know, we have been encouraged. We're giving arms, we're giving money to cause this mayhem. We're not doing it on our own. And I, I regret this way of life. I'm tired of it. I'm fed up with it. This is what one young man said. Uh, this, this, this interview has been all over the social media. So uh, I'm sorry I do not trust uh, what we are being told now officially until we, are, we can confirm that they are walking the talk okay. and that they are really resolved to bring this crisis to an end. But for right, for right now, I have no reason to believe them whatsoever. Because, see, this culture of appeasement, that once you can take up arms and terrorize people, uh, the government will treat you with, with kid gloves and people like Sheikh Gumi going up and down and making rantings that are very incoherent and very disturbing. 
you know, uh, about, you know, um, this is not their fault, you know, they have been pushed into it, and it's, they learned it from the, uh, the men group in the Niger Delta. I mean, it's true, the men, uh, you know, kidnapped a few people, but mostly they were foreign oil workers. And how many of them did they kill? You can't count them in one thing, in one hand, or two hands, you can't. They didn't kill many, but these so-called bandits, and they are not bandits, because a bandit is a, is a common thug and a thief, like the Agbero in the streets of Lagos. But these people are not Agberos. They are bandits, they are, they are, they are terrorists with, that are well-armed, and they are in a mission to kill, to maim, and to rape, and to profiteer from it. So it's not the same at all. It has absolutely no comparison whatsoever. And the government's attitude of appeasement to these groups is even more dangerous. You know, uh, Italy had that problem in the 70s. They even kidnapped a former prime minister. Uh, some of us were schoolboys. Uh, and uh, we read the story, the plea of the former prime minister, Aldo Moro, was kidnapped by some gangsters. Mm -hmm. And they were de demanding ransom. When the money didn't come, they killed him. And he wrote a letter to his wife, deeply moving. You know, after that, the Italian government decided to pass a law, making it a crime for anybody to pay a ransom. Mm. It was a very strange and bizarre law. But lo and behold, kidnapping ended dramatically. When people are being forced, no matter who it is, you don't pay a dime. But on, but, on, but on paper in Nigeria, in on paper in Nigeria, we say, oh, we don't negotiate with terrorists. I mean, I've, we, 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 even if it does happen, we never own up to it until now when it's become something of a, uh, I mean, when we had to get the, the last set of girls back from, uh, I think, yes. before, after, right after Chibok girls, the, those girls were also negotiated, the Dapchi girls, yes, I now remember. We had to negotiate, even though the government still said that, you know, no money was paid, but negotiations in itself makes it look like you're coming from a, a weak position. Now, I spoke to Sheikh Gumi yesterday, and he kept insisting that these people are, um, grew up, you know, in the worst kind of environments. They have no access to education. Um, they have no skills. They've not been able to acquire any. They've been forgotten by the government. Hence the reason why they've taken up these arms. And I asked the same. I asked the question, saying, "But we we have these same type of people spread around and spread across the country. How come these people have not resorted to doing the same thing?" And he said, "Oh, that it's a different terrain, it's a different environment, and that's why he's advocating for dialogue and negotiations. It's the best way to get them to lay down their arms." Does that not make us look like it's a double standard of sorts, especially now? Again. We're asking that these people be given amnesty. But there are people who are saying, especially you, you're kicking against the issue of amnesty. But then there are repentant terrorists that have been given a new lease of life by this same government. So if you gave it to terrorists, why not give it to bandits? Is that not a good argument? Well, two wrongs do not make a right. And it is terrible enough that people who have killed kills people, innocent people in the thousands, can be given amnesty. Some of them, I even heard, were allowed to be inducted into the armed forces. Uh, no wonder we can't be, we are not in a position to fix this issue. Some of them, are even as it's done, are being given scholarships. Look, it's not the same moral standard you can apply to men. Men who are fighting for uh, resource control, environmental damage to their this thing. They had very clear aims and objectives. And government under Umaru Yaradwa negotiated with these people. But these guys in the Northeast, uh, these terrorists uh, are killers and rapists. Uh, they're committing genocide. I don't see how you can pardon this kind of crimes. These are crimes against the state. They're not just crimes against individuals. So the fact that we made the ghastly mistake of, 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 of settling them uh, doesn't mean we should do that. And there are not bandits. I don't see any bandits here. They are all terrorists. In fact, even Gumi himself, and I don't know what moral universe he lives on. I think only he himself understands 
and shakes of his kind understand what kind of moral universe they live in. But if they live in the same ethical universe like we do, he wouldn't say some of the things he's saying. I'm, I'm quite flabbergasted uh, by some of the things he says. Um, but let's not go into that. But I don't think he's thinking very clearly. Let's go to the governor of Zamfir State, who's also all for these negotiations. Now, he said that some of the people who helped in uh, retrieving these girls from these bandits are former terrorists. They, they helped the government to get these girls back. Again, for a lot of people, it smacks of all kinds of negative. But then there are also people who are saying, well, they know this terrain better uh, and they're repentant. So why not use them? Where do you stand on this? Well, um, you know, politics is the art of the possible. And I have worked in issue, on issues of national security uh, and strategy, uh, also being a development expert and economics expert. Uh, so I cannot sit here and say that um, you don't use anyone. Sometimes you have to use the terrorists. But what you must avoid is the body language that makes it look as if you are condoning and even encouraging uh, terrorism. Mm. I have to be very honest with you. We have good reason to, to, to feel that in the past, a lot of the terrorists were treated with kid gloves. And it looks to us as if they had even infiltrated the system. And so before our armed forces can arrive, they're ambushed and they're wiped, out, wiped away. It has been an embarrassment and a disgrace for our once mighty armed forces. Mm. Uh, so the government should need to examine themselves. Uh, they need to flush out within their body politic some people who are part and parcel of the killers. That is what they need to do. Uh, and uh, short of doing that, this problem is likely to persist for a long time. After all, this young man that was interviewed just recently has been on social media. Hmm. He said that, look, I'm a poor shepherd boy. Hmm. I was given guns. I was given ammunitions and I was given a lot of money and given a mandate to do what I'm doing, I'm tired of it, I'm fed up okay. with it. Is he lying to the world? Me thinks not, I don't think he is. Okay. So those who are making all the noise now need to examine themselves. It's a case of the chickens coming home to roost, finally. Right. Anybody that lives by the sword, anybody that lives by evil will reap the results and the consequences of evil. All right. Well, on that note, I want to say thank you to you, uh, Dr. Gobadia, um, Gobadia Melafia, former Central Bank um, Governor. Thank you so much for speaking with us. It's a very sobering um, end to this conversation, but one would only wonder where's going to be the next hit. But we hope that that doesn't happen anytime soon. Thank you very much for being part of the conversation. We'll take a short but, break. But thank you so much for, for this time. And I'm very impressed with you. You asked the questions. Uh, with with passion and 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 um, patriotism, unlike a lot of people who you know, even from their line of questioning, you wonder whether they have a moral conscience at all. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much once again, Mr. Gobadaya Melafia is a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll find out what Nigerians are saying about the blockade of food to the south, and then I'll give you my take. It will really affect people because like tomatoes now has gone up, tatashi and pepe cannot avoid it. And it's not here, they are bringing it. It's from the north. So it will really affect us here in Lagos. I think it's an opportunity for us, for, for the southerners to look more into our agricultural um, uh, uh, participation, you know. Now that um, so many things is falling apart, and um, yeah, I think we, our high should be more open to um, several activities that will help and boost the unemployment rates in the country. So if 
if they are threatening to hold on to their food supply, it, I think it's a leverage for us and the government in particular for us to do more on our side here, based on agriculture, and to make them know that we can also fend for ourselves agriculturally. In my own opinion, let them open the road so that food can come. Everything now is cost. So if you don't have money now, you cannot eat any more again. So let them open the road so that food will enter. You can't say a broom, just a stick of broom, will do the sweeping for you. If we say the northern earth should go, we live by these things that they are supplying us. If there are no tomatoes, how do we survive? If there are no beef, beef in the market, people, though we can survive without them, they are talking, they are chicken and all that to eat. But the supplies, will they be done for us? So we all have to, we, we have to live together. It's just a matter of understanding. People don't understand themselves. The Aosas, the Yorubas, the Igbos, they have to be our leaders. They have to come together and understand themselves. If there is no understanding, then there is no, there is no unity. They are losing. When they, uh, they cultivate, they bring it out. They don't have anybody to sell it for. So the thing we spoil, they, they are losing now. So we... We can manage ourselves. Our banga dead there. We use our banga. We prepare it and use it and cook. We, so we don't have any problem. We can use crayfish and cook. We can use uh, dry fish and cook. Uh, any type of fish, we can use it and cook and eat and satisfy. So meat or no meat, we don't care about it. Well, it's time for my take. Every time issues that have colorations of north versus south crops up, it takes me back to national conferences and confabs that we've held in this country and the so-called no-go areas. These no-go areas have become like the elephant in the room that no one wants to acknowledge. It's time that we have that Nigerian conversation where we address these tribal and ethnic undertones and passive-aggressive attitude that we display at every turn in the nation. I mean, we can't keep sweeping these issues under the carpet. Now, food traders and cattle sellers are, uh, from the north are saying, no food for you Southerners if you don't do ABC. It's like a cold war that's brewing, yet we treat it with so much levity. There are people who are stoking this fire, wanting things to go bust. Are we going to let those people win? Are we going to stand by and watch things really fall apart? Yes, Nigeria does have its problems, but we are Nigeria, and we need to step up to our responsibilities. These divisions can continue without intervention. So we all have to come to the table and, and have that talk. Enough of these subtle resentments. Let's all speak our truths and chart a new course, because that's the only way that we can move forward as a nation. I am Mariana Cohn, thanking you for being part of the program. Have a good evening.